This is Oxford, England, one of the world's most famous university cities. It's a beautiful, privileged place, steeped in history and studded with august buildings. The elegant, honey-coloured buildings of the university's colleges wrap around tranquil courtyards that are meticulously manicured and maintained. The city's faint spires twirl into the sky above. The magnificent architecture of the 38 colleges in the city's medieval centre led to its nickname, the City of Dreaming Spires. Oxford is a wonderful place to wander. The narrow cobblestone lanes take you on a journey back through the centuries as you cross old stone bridges and pass some of the most famous landmarks in Britain. But not all the cobblestone streets in Oxford lead to places of romance and beauty. One led to a place of execution and death. This small area of cobbled stones forming a cross in the centre of Broad Street beside one of Oxford's most famous colleges marks the site where three men were led and publicly executed. It was right here that the Oxford martyrs were tied to a stake, wood piled up around them, bags of gunpowder placed around their necks and burnt alive. Who were these men and why did they die? Well, their story will surprise, shock and inspire you. Oxford is located about 80 kilometres northwest of London, in central southern England, and revolves around its prestigious university, which was recently ranked as the best in the world. Oxford University is the oldest university in Britain and the second oldest in the world. Scholars have been studying here for nearly 1,000 years. What many people don't know is that this place was once a hotbed of religious revolution. It was here in Oxford and at Cambridge University that the ideas of Martin Luther and John Kelvin, the ideas of the Protestant Reformation, began to transform the minds and hearts of the English people. They began to study the Bible and follow its teachings. As they studied the Bible, they discovered the good news that God is a God of love and that salvation is a gift, that people are saved by believing in Jesus and accepting Him as their Saviour. They found peace with God and came close to Him. The Bible and its message became important in people's lives. The context of this spiritual awakening was the religious and political upheaval that took place when King Henry VIII separated the Church of England from the Roman Catholic Church. At this time, Reformation ideas gained a foothold in Britain and particularly here at Oxford. On Henry's death, his young son Edward became king. Many of Edward's advisers tried to move the English people and the English church in the direction of the Reformation and a more Bible-based Christianity. Among these royal advisers, were three prominent university men. Nicholas Ridley was a brilliant scholar who had been palace chaplain to King Henry VIII and was Bishop of London under his son, Edward VI. He was popular with the ordinary people and his life portrayed the truths of the Christian teachings he taught. In his own household, he had daily Bible readings and encouraged the people to memorise passages of the Bible and establish a personal relationship with God. Hugh Latimer was a powerful and influential preacher under King Edward's reign. He boldly proclaimed Bible truths from the pulpit. He knew his Bible well, and his sermons encouraged people to serve God with a true heart and inward affection, not just with outward show. He practised what he preached and spent a lot of time helping the poor and visiting inmates in prison. 
Another university friend, Thomas Cranmer, traveled to Germany to learn more about the teachings of Martin Luther. On his return to England, he became an able churchman and leader of the English Reformation, eventually carrying out church reforms as the first Protestant Archbishop of Canterbury. These three university men worked hard to free their church from superstition and dead tradition. When King Edward VI died at the age of 15, Mary, his half-sister, became Queen of England in 1553. Now, Mary was a devout Roman Catholic and she worked hard to bring England back to the Roman Catholic Church. She wanted to reverse the Protestant Reformation launched by her father, King Henry VIII, and her half-brother, Edward VI. Moreover, it was Mary's mother, Catherine of Aragon, who had been cast aside by Henry VIII in favour of Anne Boleyn. The annulled marriage of her parents made Mary an illegitimate child. So she had extra reason to remain staunchly Catholic and undo her father's reforms and stamp out Protestantism and its emphasis on the Bible. And she did this by force, by persecution. She had hundreds of people put to death, often by fire, for their religious convictions. To history, she became known as Bloody Mary for the many executions she ordered. One of Mary's first acts as queen was to arrest the three university men, Ridley, Latmer and Cranmer. Suddenly, these prominent reformers became heretics, traitors and outcasts. Each one was condemned to death and executed here in Oxford. But that's not what makes the Oxford martyrs so unique. Hundreds of others died for their faith during the reign of Bloody Mary. What is so remarkable about these three individuals is how they died, how they went to the stake. These men met their barbaric deaths with extraordinary calm and steadfastness. They've become justly famous for making such a courageous stand for their faith. Now, most of us would like to assume they had enormous strength as individuals, that they were heroes who could stand alone. But there's more to the story than that. There's more to their steadfastness than that. And I'd like to share with you just why their faith proved so unshakable. The people of England who accepted the ideas of the Protestant Reformation in Europe met together in English inns where they could fellowship and study the Bible undisturbed. Now, although Ridley, Latimer and Cramner are remembered as the Oxford martyrs, they were actually all students here at Cambridge University, which is just over 100 kilometres from Oxford. A favourite meeting place of these Bible students in Cambridge was the White Horse Inn. The budding reformers nicknamed it Little Germany because the Reformation had begun in that country. These men spoke together for long hours into the night. Often the windows were shuttered. Sometimes they had to look carefully who came through the door. But their conversations about Bible truth and the meaning of the good news about Jesus were always animated. Now, we often picture martyrs as people who stand alone. They stand alone for their convictions. For most of us, that's close to a definition of a religious hero. Martyrs stand against the tide. They stand steadfast when everyone seems to be against them. They cling to the truth when the church sinks into error and wanders from the teachings of the Bible. Martyrs stand alone. Well, I'd like to suggest that this popular conception can be very misleading. It doesn't give us an accurate picture of religious heroes. Above all, it doesn't give us an accurate picture of their unshakable faith. Ridley, Latimer and Cramner did have to stand against the tide of church corruption and error, but they didn't stand alone. They didn't find their strength as solitary heroes. Their story makes one thing clear. These men stood steadfast 
because they stood in a circle. They found their inner strength in a very intense kind of fellowship. They found their strength by opening the Bible together and studying together and praying together. That's what happened at places like the White Horse Inn. At one point, Ridley had to appear before the Bishop of Lincoln to explain his views. The Bishop threatened him with excommunication, being cut off from the so-called One Holy Church. But notice what Ridley said in response. I acknowledge the unspotted Church of Christ, which is spread through all the world. I am fully persuaded that Christ's Church is everywhere founded in every place where his gospel is truly received and effectually followed. Yes, Ridley and his companions did have to make a stand against the practices of the church of their day, but they never felt they were above the need for fellowship. They never stood against the need to belong to a body of believers. These men wanted to reform and purify the church, not destroy it. They were fundamentally men who built up. They followed Paul's admonition in Hebrews chapter 10. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. These English reformers understood their need to meet together for mutual encouragement. In fact, they built up Christian fellowship wherever they went, even here in the Tower of London. After Queen Mary came to the throne, Ridley, Latimer and Cramner were all sent to the Tower of London. They were kept in separate cells, but they managed to send letters back and forth. These men were still working out the implications of Bible teachings. Remember, they were early pioneers in the Reformation. They were just beginning to challenge the teachings of the medieval church. And so they kept sharing insights, passing along verses of scripture, refining their beliefs. They communicated their views, responding back and forth. And after many months of physical isolation, the day came when these men were allowed to stay together in the tower. Now there could be no hindrance to their fellowship. Latimer referred to the joyful experience in this way. Behold the providence of God, which will have this truth known, did bring this to pass. We were thrust into one chamber as men not to be accounted of, but God be thanked to our great joy and comfort. There did we together read over the New Testament with great deliberation. So how did these men spearhead the Reformation in England? By studying God's Word together, by praying together. They stood in a circle based on Scripture. They discovered truth in a circle. That's the second thing we need to understand about these religious heroes. They didn't assume they could come up with the whole truth and nothing but the truth individually on their own. They didn't conduct a private search for the truth. They looked for more truth together in the study of God's Word. And so they grew together. These men experienced the kind of fellowship that the Apostle Peter describes in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring Word of God. We stand in a circle when we obey the truth together. That creates a special bond of love. We stand in a circle on the imperishable Word of God. That's how our faith grows into something unshakable. In early 1554, the three reformers were transferred from London to Oxford and imprisoned in the Bacardo prison, the Oxford town prison, 
which was located here near the St. Michael at the North Gate Church at the North Gate of the city walls. The door of their cell is on display in the tower of the church. In April 1554, they were summoned to stand trial and were interrogated separately here in the University Church of St. Mary the Virgin. They were pressed to disavow their belief in the Bible and their Protestant beliefs, but refused. They were sentenced to death by burning. On October 16, 1555, Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer were led along the streets of Oxford toward the place of execution. Ridley wore a black gown ornamented with fur and a velvet shoulder cape. He was in good spirits. He had decided to look his best for this occasion when he would make the ultimate sacrifice, when he would experience a special bond with Christ in suffering. He was going with style and dignity to his execution. Latimer was dressed more simply, but he too walked along rather cheerfully, though quite feeble now in his old age. Town officials made sure there were plenty of soldiers stationed by these streets to prevent any rescue or protest that sympathetic citizens might attempt. Finally, they arrived here at the execution location marked today by a cobblestone cross. In 1555, the place of the execution lay outside the north wall in a wide ditch. Ridley had been subjected to a ceremony of degradation the day before, when all his religious offices and honours were taken away. Latimer had been publicly disgraced years before. The doomed men had nothing left in terms of worldly support. But there was one thing no one could take away from them, and that was their bond of faith in Jesus Christ. They were still standing in the circle. When the soldiers led them into the ditch where the terrible fires would be lit, Ridley knelt down by the stake, kissed it, and began to pray. Latimer knelt beside him and prayed too, with great fervour. It was a scene none of the spectators would ever forget. A church official began to speak to the crowd. He warned of the grave errors into which these two so-called heretics had fallen. And while his voice droned on, Ridley and Latimer had a few moments to talk together. There they were, standing against the piles of wood and the fearful stake, surrounded by soldiers and church officials in imposing robes a man with a fiery torch stood nearby, ready. But the two condemned men were talking earnestly, encouraging each other, keeping the light of faith bright in each other's eyes. They remembered the old days at the White Horse Inn. They remembered how thrilling their discoveries had been, how wonderful it was to see the good news of Jesus in the Bible as if for the very first time and how wonderful it was to share it with their family and friends. Standing here beside the stake, Ridley and Latimer knew that the joy of fellowship was still theirs. They were still standing in the circle. After the charges had been read, the two men asked permission to speak. It was denied unless they recanted. Ridley replied, so long as breath is in my body, I will never deny my Lord Christ and his known truth. God's will be done in me. The attendant blacksmith then chained the two men together to the stake. Bags of gunpowder were then tied around their necks so that death in the flames might come more speedily. Finally, a fiery torch was put to the pyre. It was then that Latimer uttered those famous words. Be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle, by God's grace in England, as I trust shall never be put out. Thomas Cramner was forced to watch his friends suffer in the flames. 
and perhaps overwhelmed by the death of his fellow reformers, he recanted his Protestant beliefs and the truths of the Bible. However, Queen Mary doubted his sincerity and he was still burned right here at the very same location five months later. Before he died, Cramner was allowed to preach a final sermon here at the University Church in Central Oxford. Standing in the pulpit and addressing the priests, he rejected his earlier recantations and denounced the errors of the medieval church. He restated his belief in the truths of the Bible and his trust in Jesus as his saviour. He was immediately removed from the church pulpit and brought directly here to the stake. As the execution pyre was lit and the flames reached upwards, Kremner held up the hand that had signed his recantation and plunged it into the flames so that it should be burned first, crying out, this is the hand that offended. The flames of the fire were so intense that they scorched the doors of nearby Balliol College. The doors have since been moved from the street gate to an inner gate. Today they are hung between the quads of Balliol College as a reminder of the Oxford martyrs who were willing to make the ultimate sacrifice for their belief in the Bible and Jesus Christ. And as Ridley said, as the flames consumed him, we shall light this day a candle by God's grace in England, as I trust shall never be put out. Yes, Ridley, Latimer and Cramner and many others did light candles. And those candles have never been put out. They've gone on burning brighter and brighter because those men were standing fast in the circle of faith. In his letter to Timothy, the Apostle Paul wrote this admonition. I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Notice how Paul describes the church. It is the pillar and ground or foundation of truth. That's what God designed His church to be. God's true church is a circle based on the authority of the Bible, the Word of God, and no other authority. It's not just a collection of traditions. It's the pillar and foundation of the truth. God has always had His witnesses to that truth. Sometimes they're persecuted. Often they're in the minority. But that circle of faith has been kept alive down through the centuries. In their day, Ridley, Latimer and Cramner kept the flame burning. They represent the great fraternity of the faithful, people who are bonded in the simplicity of the gospel, people whose faith proves unshakable in the worst of times. These men give us a glimpse of what God's last day church called the remnant will be like. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17 refers to a cosmic struggle in the last days between the dragon, that is Satan, and the woman, God's true church. The dragon went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You'll notice it says the rest of her offspring. That's the remnant the faithful in the end times. And what are they like? Well, they're still committed to the faith of Jesus Christ, the testimony of Christ. They're still standing on the Word. They're still united in Christ. They keep the flame of truth alive. Their faith still proves unshakable. Are you standing in a circle today? Or are you trying to stand alone? Are you just settling for your own opinions about God? Or are you making exciting discoveries with a group of true believers? Listen, we need each other. We can't stand alone. Faith was never meant to be something private and hidden. It was meant to be shared. It was meant to be the thing that glues together our most precious relationships. Will you make a commitment with me right now? 
a decision to do something very basic, something very important. Will you become a part of the circle of faith based on faithfulness to God's Word, the Bible? Find a place of fellowship in Jesus Christ and begin investing yourself? Let's start standing in a circle now. Why not make that decision right now as we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word, the Bible, that guides us and teaches us Your truth. It tells us that there is a God in heaven who loves us and who cares for us. We thank You for the encouraging example of the Oxford martyrs who remained faithful to Jesus and His Word, the Bible, and kept the flame of truth alive. Lord, we too want to stand in the circle of faith. We want to find a place of fellowship in Jesus Christ. We want to find salvation and peace in Him, our Saviour, and accept Your invitation to stand in Your circle. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would like your heart filled with God's love and find a deeper faith and a stronger relationship with Him, I'd like to recommend the free gift we have for all our viewers today. Our free gift for you today is the wonderful book, Standing in the Circle. This book will draw you closer to Christ and His Word, the Bible. This book is our special gift to you today. It's absolutely free and there are no costs whatsoever. So don't miss this opportunity to obtain your own copy of this book, Standing in the Circle. Here's the information you need. Phone or text us at 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand or visit our website tij.tv to request today's free offer and we'll send it to you totally free of charge and with no obligation. Write to us at GPO Box 274, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001, Australia or PO Box 76673, Manukau, Auckland, 2241, New Zealand. Don't delay. Call or text us now.